So I'm um, starting with the idea of, well, why does Earth have an atmosphere in the first place? Not all planets have atmospheres. So where did we get ours from? Um, and it turns out that for all terrestrial planets, this same sort of process occurred. Uh, we started with some primary atmosphere when the planet was formed. And most of this atmosphere was just the gas that was around the planet as it was forming um, from the you know, process of coalescence. And that was mostly made of hydrogen and helium. And those are really light molecules. And so they escaped into space because Earth's uh, gravity wasn't strong enough to hold them in. So after we lost our first primary atmosphere, Earth gained a secondary atmosphere, primarily from volcanic activity that um, you know, belches out different gases that are trapped within. And so this secondary atmosphere built over time from volcanic activity, and then its composition was changed over time by processes due to life. So all of the oxygen, for example, came from two big oxygenation events um, from early microbial life and then from later photosynthetic life. Okay, so three atmospheres, primary, secondary, and then the, I guess, current atmosphere um, that we are familiar with. And so what is the composition of the atmosphere overall and how has it changed over time? Um, this graph is showing, sorry, um, time in billions of years ago. So Earth formed around four and a half billion years ago with the solar system, and here we are today. And what we're looking at here is the percentage of atmospheric gases that are these different constituents. So you can see that early on, we had a lot of water vapor in our atmosphere, quite a bit of CO2, which is generated from volcanoes, um, nitrogen, and then some methane and ammonia early on. And the share of CO2 and water vapor, this um, falls off as the planet cools and this carbon dioxide is locked into liquid water. So carbon dioxide can dissolve into liquid water. And then as this, um, as erosion processes happen, carries CO2 into the rock. And then that is reincorporated into the Earth's rock. So that rock cycle, um, you know, puts carbon dioxide into the atmosphere from volcanoes and then pulls it back out from uh, erosion processes that, that lock that carbon dioxide back into the rock. So the, since the percentage change, um, the, you know, the percentage of nitrogen increases, not because the amount of nitrogen increases, but just because the amount of carbon dioxide and water vapor is going down, right? Okay, so eventually it's not until uh, life begins that oxygen is created in large amounts. And so the present day atmosphere is about 78% nitrogen. Almost the rest is oxygen and every other constituent is only present in trace amounts. Okay, and the atmosphere is organized into layers. Um, so the only thing I wanna point out about this graph is um, the temperature here measured in Kelvin. 300 Kelvin is about room temperature on the Kelvin scale, uh, which goes from zero being as cold as it can possibly get anywhere in the universe, uh, absolute zero, which is never reached ever. Um, and it just goes up from there. So 300 is room temperature. And in general, it gets cooler as we go up in height. Um, all of the weather that we experience happens um, here in the troposphere. Uh, in the stratosphere, it starts to increase in temperature due to the ozone layer, which traps UV radiation from the sun. And as you saw from the pre-class assignment, this breaks apart the ozone molecules and this uh, heats the region that contains the ozone layer. After that, the temperature drops with increasing height again until we reach the ionosphere. And this is where um, radiation from the sun is ripping apart other types of molecules other than ozone. All right, so there's this kind of temperature profile in different atmospheric layers. And we'll see that this profile uh, repeats in ways that tell us about the chemical constituents in different layers of the atmospheres of the other planets too. Okay, so weather, which all occurs in the troposphere uh, is driven by convection, just like the magnetic field, just like plate tectonics. So convective cells, again, form in the atmosphere um, that transport heat and within that heat, 
that hot air moisture. And this creates all the wind and weather patterns that we see on the surface of the earth. And this includes the trade winds. So these two images are how the trade winds get set up. So you probably know that we experience westerly winds in the Northern hemisphere. Generally wind blows from west to east. Uh, when it doesn't, it can cause real problems like the wildfires we saw earlier this year that were caused by those strong easterly winds. Um, and then there's also uh, similar westerlies uh, in the Southern hemisphere and um, easterly winds uh, in the tropics. And it turns out that near the equator, there's an area that doesn't have very strong winds at all. These are called the doldrums, which I find amusing uh, because sailors had a, a hard time sailing in that region. Um, so I don't know if you've ever used the word doldrums for describing being like down in the dumps. Okay, so what happens to set up the trade winds is that the hot air at the equator rises and cools uh, in the polar regions, sinking in the polar regions. And it sets up these convective cells that we see where hot air is rising and then sinking uh, in the Northern latitudes and Southern latitudes. And so just these same convective cells kind of like as a belt around the entire planet cause the trade winds to, um, to be established. Okay, so all other weather is also driven by convection. And of course there are different um, factors that influence the amount of heat that's available and how it redistributes. And this is why weather is so complicated uh, because there's uh, you know, so, much, so many different ways for the heat to travel. And so, well, you know how complicated it is and how difficult it is to forecast. Okay, so how is weather different than climate? I think the, the quote from the book is pretty good. Um, climate in general is just the long-term average of weather. So climate is what you expect and weather is what you get. Weather varies on short time scales. Climate is generally stable on short time scales, but it can vary over large time scales. And the earth has had different climates in the past. So different averages of weather in the past, most notably the ice ages. And one of the ways that we describe uh, global climate is by looking at global average temperature. So some, at, sometimes the planet may have a lower average temperature. At other times, it may end up with a higher average temperature. And so uh, these average temperatures, um, they're not just related to the atmosphere, but the atmosphere is part of it. Um, and really to understand where, why a planet has a particular temperature, we need to look at the energy balance of the planet. So here's the Earth, um, and there's some incoming sunlight, and there's some amount of energy uh, carried within that incoming sunlight. It heats the surface of the earth and every hot object glows. It releases some heat radiation. You're doing it, I'm doing it. My cat on my lap is releasing radiation. And so is the earth. And so if the outgoing radiation and the incoming radiation from the sun are balanced, then the earth will be at it, what we call its equilibrium temperature. If we increase the amount of sunlight, then the temperature will go up until we reach a new equilibrium. So it will heat the ground until the ground is hotter and the hotter ground will generate more outgoing heat. So slowly all planets will find their way to their equilibrium temperature. All right, so you can see how if you're farther from the sun, you might expect to have a lower equilibrium temperature simply because there will be less incoming sunlight. Uh, but there's another factor other than distance from the sun, which is atmosphere. So some of this outgoing heat can actually get trapped by molecules in your atmosphere. And as you saw in your pre-class assignment, um, some species of uh, molecules are more effective at trapping heat because of the way that they interact with uh, the heat or infrared light. Okay, so if I map out what happens to all of the energy coming from the incoming sunlight, this is what it looks like. So this uh, region here, this yellow stripe is all of the incoming solar radiation. And as this comes to the Earth, um, some of it is reflected by clouds, by the atmosphere, and also by the polar ice caps. And about 23% of Earth's energy is reflected completely. I guess the ice caps are part of this reflected by surface part. Okay, so all of the solar radiation that is reflected by clouds, atmosphere, and the surface adds up to about 29% of that total. So the rest of it, um, some of it is absorbed directly in the atmosphere, 
but most of it is absorbed by the surface of the earth. And so that heats the surface and then several things can happen. Some of it um, is, some of that heat is convected away. And you know, this is all the weather that we're seeing, right? This is the convection process driving the weather. Um, some of that heat uh, drives the evaporation of water, which also you know, influences the water cycle, influences the weather. And then some of it is uh, radiated by the surface. And of the surface radiation, some of this is, um, you know, just goes back out into space, um, but others are absorbed by the atmosphere, by the greenhouse gases, which is this dark gray word here, and radiated back to the earth. Atmosphere, as we've seen before, has changed in the past, and currently it's human beings that are driving the change. Um, so specifically with regards to carbon dioxide, um, looking back for hundreds of thousands of years, um, Carbon dioxide has had various cycles due to uh, life and due to volcanic events, uh, but currently it's at a much higher level than it has ever been in the past. And if you want more information on this, the um, NASA climate website is really interesting and uh, has very, I think, accessible uh, ways to think about past climate changes.